So the psalm, as Dave just sang, Come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him, and the sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Then it says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. And then it says this, Today, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah and as you did that day at Massah in the desert where your fathers tested and tried me, though they'd seen what I'd done. For 40 years I was angry with that generation. I said, there are people whose hearts go astray and they have not known my ways. So, the Lord says, I declared an oath in my anger that they'll never enter my rest. You know, we talked at the beginning of this series about how the Psalms, uh, some of them are blues and some of them are gospel music. This one is kind of a mixture, isn't it? Uh, I've, heard, I've heard your song, your worship song, on virtually my whole life. And um, I thought that was all of Psalm 95. I thought you captured the whole thing. And then when I, when I come and look at it, I go, well, that's great for the first half. <laughs> and then it gets a little bit bluesy. And, uh, and so as we look at this, I start thinking, okay, so what is it about worship? When we gather, when, when, when followers of Christ gather around the world, uh, different places, in cathedrals and big churches and neighborhood churches and homes and uh, in Starbucks, probably, that's kind of the worship center right now. And uh, what is it that makes good worship? And what is it that keeps us from experiencing uh, worship the way God intended it to be? And the more I think about it, the more I think it depends on our attitudes as we enter into God's presence. Um, and I, and I don't like that personally because I think of all the times like when, when we were a young family and uh, I was a uh, pastor down at a church in the U District and, and we'd come like uh, uh, ragged uh, pilgrims, you know, usually like, like I mean, when I was even a kid, it's a generational. When I was a kid, you know, my dad's swatting over the seat telling us to shut up and sit and don't touch each other and, and everything. And, and then when we pull into the church parking lot, you get that, okay now, Everybody smile. Everybody smile. Here we go. We're going into church. You know, and it's like there's a disconnect between the drive in and the experience there, you know. I know that didn't happen to you today. Eileen and I actually had one of those things today. <laughs> I tried to make up for it by stopping at QFC and getting there a donut, but you know it just didn't make up for it. <laughs> but you know, you, you struggle you know, in your life, and then you come in, and now we're here to worship. You know? And the team gets up, and they go, come on, let's all praise the Lord. And you're going, yeah, okay, you know. <laughs> but there's something about what happens in our lives and, and how we come. And so this invitation in this song, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. And shout out loud, because the Lord's a great God. And come, let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord. It's an invitation uh, for us to get out of our stuff and out of our issues and out of our things that are going on inside and say, let's set that aside. And the focus of worship is not going to be our stuff. Why am I grateful for that? It's not what it's about. When you come in, what's the subject of worship? It's the Lord. What's the focus of worship? It's the Lord. You know, one of the things that we usually do here, we're not doing today, but we usually do is that when we have a sharing time and everybody bring their praises and their prayer requests and everybody brings an odd assortment of things. Uh, some people ask me now, doesn't that shift the focus onto people? 
And I go, no, actually, it's just a chance for us to say what's already on our minds so we can let it go and then let the Lord speak into our life. Because otherwise, we'll sit there and hold on to whatever our issue is. And so by saying, hey, can you pray for me about this or can you celebrate this with me? Then we can let it go. Okay, great. Now we're ready for what God wants to do with us. And, and there's a sense in which um, this call to come into God's presence and do something that's probably not all that natural, sing to the Lord and shout to him. Like, how many of you do singing in other areas of your life? You, you do, like, you know, you go to work and they have a staff meeting and they gather around <laughs> with the supervisor and then they all break out the hymnals and start singing together? I don't think so. At least know where I ever worked. And I, and I even worked in churches and never did that. <laughs> you know, uh, you go shopping, you're something, you know, you're down at the mall, or uh, you go into a store, you know, pennies, and, uh, and uh, they don't greet you with a song. They don't say, you know, what a glorious day we're here in shopping. You know, they nothing. Uh, there's no singing. Right? And yet, this is the call. When you come to worship, it's to do something that's not really natural for us. And it's something that we're probably not all that comfortable with. And and it's something that if I do it, I want to do it when I'm alone and probably in a small confined space like a shower. <laughs> well, that's about it. Not with other people who I don't really know that well. And, you know, and yet we become very vulnerable when we come together and we and we worship in, in song. Um, I have a friend who we've met together for years and years and years. And... Uh, every week and uh, he always tells me you know what needs to happen in this church which he doesn't attend by the way <laughs> more than like Easter but um, he uh, the thing he really thinks would help this church is if we would just stop singing <laughs> and he said you know how awkward that is to sit in the back and listen to everybody singing <laughs> he goes, well, too bad <laughs> Too bad. And then I've had other people go, you know, you know, if you just would shorten that sermon down, you know, that would really help her. You know, anyway, uh, there's all kinds of issues that we bring of what we would like that would make worship better for us, right? It would fit us. And uh, this psalm is telling us it's not about that. It's not about um, us. It's about the Lord. And how do we come to worship? How, how do we come? With thanksgiving. Let's come before him with thanksgiving. I think that gratitude may be the core of what needs to happen in our lives as we go through hearts. I'm not denying the hard stuff and good stuff and all the different confusing issues. It's a gratitude and thanksgiving that if we bring that and express that, we are open in a whole new way for God to reach us and to grow us and to help us and change us and mold us into his image if we come with thankfulness. If we come with entitlement, no, nah, not much is going to happen. If we come with uh, resentment, if we come with uh, dashed expectations, if we come with disappointment, if we come with uh, negotiation, if we come with any other thing, God can't really get a hold of us. It's, it's when we come with thanksgiving that we become open and that we become pliable to God. And um, it, it was a... You know, I've told you this, it was, that was a hard thing for me because I was, I was not a thankful person for a long, long time. Because, and for good reason. You know, I had so many good reasons why I didn't have to be thankful right now. You know, and, uh, and God kept going, yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, let's go. <laughs> waiting for you, man. Until I had to actually choose willfully to start being grateful every day. And that changed me. You know, it took a while. I, was, I wasn't going to give up my bad habits, uh, you know, without a fight. <laughs> now, we come, we worship, we bow down, we kneel before the Lord. It's all expressions of submission, right? Of um, we're not in charge. And then this psalm takes a radical turn. It just takes a swerve off the highway. And, and uh, in verse 8, 
today. First of all, it, said, it, said, it leads into this. You know, he's our God. We're the people of his pasture. We're the flock under his care. Like, you know, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. And, and uh, you know, providing, protecting, leading, all of those things. And then it immediately follows with, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Do not harden your hearts like the people of Israel did in Meribah and Massa. Now, you may not know what that is. In, the, in Exodus, um, when the people of Israel traveling through the desert you know, with, with uh, Moses, they griped and complained. I almost said a bad word right there, but I caught myself. That's the power of Ritalin. And uh, <laughs> they griped and complained, and, and they, no matter what God did, as soon as they got to another situation, it was like, forgot that, and what's he going to do now? And they hated Moses, which is so great, because you know, everybody looks up to Moses as a big leader. They hated him. You know, what, what is it? He brought us here to die. Let's choose a new leader who's going to take us back to slavery. Wouldn't that be good? Because obviously Moses isn't going to do that, so let's get somebody else who will. And, and they, this constant struggle. And so in this place of Meribah, that, that's where the people are complaining, you brought us out here to die, we don't have any water, blah, blah, blah. And God says, you know, they're griping about you, they're griping about me, they're always griping, but yeah, okay, we'll give them water, you know, here's some water for you, miraculously. And then uh, they had a masa, means in, in Hebrew, uh, the place of a trial. They, uh, they contested against God. They, they put God on trial. Isn't that cool? And, and, they, and so you have this bitter funkiness and putting God on trial. And he said, don't harden your heart because that's what happens. Um, our hearts get hardened, mine does, when we forget what God's done, right? And it's easy to forget, you know, whatever happened yesterday and those miracles because well, I don't know if God's going to come true now. And then we take that step where we put God on trial. Come on, Lord, prove yourself. What are you going to do now? Come on. You know, as, as if, and, and so uh, years ago, um, C.S. Lewis, who was the Oxford uh, Don, wrote an essay. He, he wanted it um, to be published, and it was called Difficulties in Presenting the Christian Faith to Modern Unbelievers in London. And uh, it, it wasn't widely received, obviously. Um, the editor republished it and called it um, God in the Dock. And, and I bought this book in college, I think, and I didn't get what God in the Dock was it like fishing and they're down at the harbor. And then years later, I, I discovered that uh, the dock is where the accused stands in court in the, in the British legal system. That's where the guilty one stands or the judge reads the... Um, punishment. And so God in the dock suddenly made sense. And, and this is what he said. The ancient people approached God as the accused person approaches the judge. But for the modern person, the roles are reversed. He's the judge and God is in the dock. God's on trial. Modern people are quite a kindly judge. If God should have a reasonable defense for being the God who permits war and poverty and disease, then we're ready to listen. The trial may even end in God's acquittal. But the important thing is that man is on the bench and God is in the dock. This, don't we do this all the time? we we'll, we'll put God on trial. And, and we go, oh Lord, well, come on, prove yourself. Prove yourself. How do we worship when we put God on trial? How do we worship when we forget uh, what he's done for us up till now? When we don't remember anymore? <laughs> when we make ourselves the judge and the jury and the accuser and the victim often, <laughs> um, basically we're saying we're in charge and we want it our way. Um, my old boss, Bruce Larson, used to say, hell is the place for people who want it their way. 
that Burger King is Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> Have it your way. <laughs> oh, no, Hamilton's here. But uh, hell is the place where you want your way, okay. And, and he used to say, you know, God doesn't send anybody to hell. We demand our right to be there. <laughs> we demand our place. <laughs> no, I'm not going to go with you to heaven. I'm going to hell where I belong, <laughs> you know, because I can have it my way. And you think about it, and, and, and this uh, psalm is saying, don't harden your heart today. Don't harden your heart. Don't have bitterness and resentments and all these things that, that cause us to forget what God's done. And put ourselves in the in the uh, as the judge of God. Now, some of you know I've told you this before. Uh, I I got to see the Rolling Stones first American tour, and for most of you, you don't know who they are, but it was a musical group years ago. <laughs> and uh, their first American tour, they came to San Diego, and I couldn't get a date, so I took my sister. You know, <laughs> <That's a big laughs> <mistake. laughs> but I was so thrilled with everything. But the thing was, they had that song. Um, Mick, you know, you have to do this dramatically. You'll never break, never break, never break, never break. And then he'd slam it with his heart of stone. And then Keith would go, do, 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 do. So, <laughs> and I sat there mesmerized. I go, this is it. This is the secret. Mick and the boys have shown me the secret at this early age. We can never break this heart of stone. That's what I want. I want a heart of stone. I don't want to care, and I don't want to get hurt, and I don't want to bother with other people and their issues and whether they love me or not. No, 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 no. I bought into it. And this passage says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Years later, when I was trying to live out my commitment to Mick and the boys, I found this passage in Ezekiel. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you your heart of stone. I'll remove that and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow me. I think that was one of those conversion experiences for me. I needed radical heart surgery. I needed a heart replacement. And I had to allow God to take my heart of stone that I had cultivated and to pry in and use to keep everybody away. And I had to let him give me a heart of flesh, which meant what? It breaks. It hurts. It gets an irregular beat every once in a while, right? It gets clogged up when I eat too much uh, Cajun sausage. <laughs> It'll probably let me down. I'm now vulnerable. God's going to take out our heart of stone, which makes us invulnerable, and make it so we hurt. So don't harden your heart. But what if we hurt? Yeah, you will. You will. And we're going to use every one of those hurts to encourage people, to reach out, to touch, to uh, find someone else who hurts and link up with them and together discover what it is to, to trust God anyway. Okay, that's enough for today. Um, let's pray. Lord, uh, we do belong to you and we love you, but Lord, there's so many ways that we, we forget quickly what you've done, who you are to us. And so give us the courage to trust you and to um, allow you to do your heart surgery in us. Lord, it may be hard for us to say today, but Lord, help us not to harden our hearts. Help us to stay vulnerable and, and hurtable and caring. And Lord, you protect us and you love us through it all. Amen.